Barak Man Rahim. Uh, again, we have uh, AS Biology 9700 March 21, and this is the second video on this in which we're going to discuss question 5 and 6 only. We've done question 1, 2, 3, and 4 in the first video on this um, paper, which is the March 2021 paper 2 2. In March, there's only one paper, there's no other variant. Let's look at question number 5. Each meristem cell in a leaf bud is able to grow and divide by mitosis to produce two daughter cells that are genetically identical to each other and to the original dividing cell. Figure 5.1 lists the stages in the mitotic cell cycle of a meristem. So now you see at times in the MCQs the mitotic cell cycle refers only to mitosis at times it refers to the whole story. So they start off with G1 phase, S phase, G2 phase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. Now this is the part which is actually mitosis. But of course the whole thing is called the mitotic cell cycle. And then we have cytokinesis which is not part of mitosis. And then it produces the two daughter cells. So they've given you this information. And this is figure 5.1. It says outline and explain the events occurring during S phase, metaphase and anaphase of the mitotic cell cycle that are important in the production of genetically identical daughter cells. So only those parts which are important. So in S phase, there's DNA replication. Explanation is it produces two genetically identical DNA molecules. So outline and explain. So DNA replication produces two genetically identical DNA molecules. Then in metaphase, chromosomes align at the equator. And what happens? Chromosomes are orientated, so sister chromatids shared out to daughter cells because then they're going to be pulled apart and they're going to move to the poles. And in anaphase, so we had to describe S phase, metaphase, and anaphase. And if you remember in anaphase, I always say to you apart or alag, and centromere splits, and the sister chromatids move to the opposite poles. So basically in anaphase, we were expecting you to give me this information in which you see this is what we had, this was one, then we had another one attached, and this was the centromere. So we expected you to tell us that the centromere splits in the middle. And now this will move upwards and this will move to the other side. So mitosis, anaphase, centromere splits, and the sister chromatids will now not be called sister, but once they are separated, the sisters are separated, now they'll be called chromosomes. So they move to the opposite poles. Of the question immediately after cytokinesis, daughter cells are not identical, even though they are genetically identical. So the chromosome matter is the same, genetically identical, but there's something else which is not exactly the same. Suggest a reason why daughter cells are not identical immediately after cytokinesis, because maybe there is unequal sharing of the cytoplasm. Maybe some of the organelles, one has 10 mitochondria, the other has only 9 mitochondria. Maybe one has 100 ribosomes and the other has 120 ribosomes. So unequal sharing of the cytoplasm or unequal sharing of the organelles or you could have named the organelles. So the reason is that cytoplasm division is uh, slightly random. It's not exactly uh, equal division. So a little bit is one, one of the cell is favored and may get a few more organelles than the other one. So this was the unequal sharing of cytoplasm which was of course the cause of it not being exactly identical. Then some of the cells resulting from the mitotic division in the young leaf from elongated cells. So you had these elongated cells joined end to end and it's got the vacuole and it's got cell wall and cell membrane and cytoplasm and all that. So some of the cells resulting from mitotic division in the young leaf form elongated cells that develop into xylem vessel elements. The xylem vessel elements are joined end to end to form xylem vessels. Suggest the structural changes that occur when elongated cells develop into xylem vessel elements and explain how these changes help xylem vessel to perform their function. First of all, let's talk about the function. Transports water and dissolved mineral ions. Now, what happens to these elongated cells? Now, you can see how I've drawn these elongated cells and we say the cross walls break. So the cross walls in between, you see this was originally a whole cell, now only a little bit of the remnants of the cross walls you can see. So cross walls break 
and it forms a continuous column, cytoplasm and the cell contents die. Now you can't say xylem is dead. Why? Because even a dead bird is not hollow. But what you're trying to say is that making a hollow continuous channels are being formed. So you say, well, of course, we say cell contents die, cytoplasm is also gone, there's no cytoplasm, there's no cell vacuole, there's nothing. So it's just a hollow. But you can't say xylem is dead because something dead, like a dead tree is not hollow or a dead bird or a dead frog or a dead lizard is not hollow. So the question that they asked you was stay, suggest the structural changes and then explain how these changes help xylem. So number one transports water and mineral ions, end walls broken down. So tubes form, continuous flow. There is lignification. You see lignin is deposited. And lignin is deposited in different forms, sometimes in a spiral form. And this is called lignification. So lignification takes place and lignin is deposited. Lignin strengthens the vessels. And of course, the cell contents die. Cells become hollow. So we can't say xylem is dead. We say cell death. Some of the cells, actually, all the contents of it are just, you know, they're no longer there. And this is the reason why these hollow continuous channels can transport greater quantity of water can flow per unit time. Why? Because they're hollow tubes now. Now they don't have any, uh, any uh, vacuole membrane or tonoplast or cytoplasm. So there's nothing to hinder or interrupt their flow. So there's uninterrupted continuous flow of water in these xylem vessels. Then coming on to the part two of the question, it says figure 5.2 is a planned drawing of a transverse section through a dicot leaf. And I add a label line and the letter X to in figure 4.2, which is this one, to identify the location of the xylem tissue. And I've just done that for you. You can see this is the X and this was only for one mark. So you had to give me the label line and you had to write X here to show me because you remember in a leaf, leaf, upper xylem. So this is the xylem and this lower part is the phloem, which of course they've not asked you, but I'm just telling you to revise you. So this would be the phloem. And this is the midrib of the leaf. And this upper part would have the xylem in it. So that was a simple, easy question. Coming to question number six. In March 2019, a tropical cyclone in the southwest Indian Ocean caused widespread flooding in a number of countries. The flooding and the damage caused by the cyclone meant that many people were at serious risk of cholera. After the natural disaster occurred, many different areas reported outbreaks of cholera. Within a short time, the disease had spread widely and large numbers of people were affected. Now, first we have to revise what was cholera. Cholera is a disease which is uh, waterborne and foodborne. It's caused by the bacteria called Vibrio cholera, and you must know the spelling of it. So this is Vibrio and cholera, and if, of course all of it should have been in a small r. There should be no capital letters in it. So let's correct this. So no capital letters, and uh, it is there is an e at the end, cholera e, and you must spell it correctly to get your one mark, which is absolutely essential because on this, we do not compromise on the spellings. We have to have the spellings correct and other things we can get away with the wrong spelling. Uh, B part of the question, suggest and explain why the people affected by the cyclones were at a serious risk of cholera. Basically, you see what happens, people with cholera pass the bacteria in their feces. And somehow if those feces contaminate a water source like a well, or a pond or a lake where people drink water from that area. Well, of course, the feces contain the bacterial bacteria which causes cholera, and that bacteria contaminates water. And when somebody is drinking that water, is actually taking in those bacteria, and those are entering his stomach, and then of course cause an infection in his intestines. So cholera was already present in the area. Contaminated water contains pathogens. Pathogen transmitted by the fecal oral route. So the bacteria are passed out in the feces. And if somehow flies sit on the feces and then sit on your food and you eat that food or uh, the bacteria, the, the feces contaminate a water source and the feces, you know, sort of enter a water uh, place where the people are going to drink water from that source. So fecal oral route, that's called the fecal oral route. 
And because there's been a cyclone, so all the houses have been destroyed, all the water supply, the pipes, the sewage disposal, everything has been destroyed. So there's no clean drinking water. There's no safe disposal of sewage. The toilets are not covered. So when people go and defecate anywhere and everywhere, then flies sit on the feces, then flies sit on the food, and people are eating that food. So flies transferring pathogens from feces to food. So these were all any three of these and you would have, this is remember, look at the marks and then see how many points you're going to give me there for this three mark question. And coming to the C part of the question, in addition to the standard treatment for cholera, antibiotics are recommended for people who are moderately ill or seriously ill with the disease. Doxycycline is one of the main antibiotics, Vibramycin it's also called, used for the treatment of cholera. Doxycycline enters the pathogen and binds to one of the subunits of the bacterial ribosome. So you remember there's a cell wall and then there's a cell membrane and inside there's a loop of DNA and it has 70 S ribosomes. So the doxycycline, which is the antibiotic, enters the bacteria which causes cholera and binds to one of the subunits of the bacterial ribosome. This prevents growth and reproduction of the bacterial cell. So the bacterial cell will not grow and reproduce. So that will help the patient to recover. Suggest and explain how binding to, uh, of doxycycline to ribosome stops growth of the bacterial cell. Now mRNA unable to bind. You see, remember, DNA to mRNA is transcription and then translation has to take place on the ribosome. So ribosome subunits unable to come together, tRNA unable to bind to ribosome, mRNA codon and tRNA anticodon binding not possible, translation is prevented, enzymes required for growth not produced. Basically, proteins will not be made and a bacteria needs enzymes which is going to result in extracellular digestion and the bacteria derives its nutrients in this way, like in our intestine food is digested, but the bacteria just releases the enzyme, digests, and then those products of digestion enter into the bacteria and the bacteria grows and reproduces. Then it says penicillin, then we come to part two. Penicillin, which is used to be prescribed for the treatment of cholera, has a different mechanism of action to doxycycline. State which part of the bacterial cell is affected by the action of penicillin. You know, it prevents the cross links between the peptidoglycan which are present in the cell wall. So the cell wall synthesis is going to be affected by this uh, penicillin. Then we come to the D part of the question. Mozambique was one of the countries badly affected by the cyclone. As part of the effort to prevent a greater number of cases of cholera from occurring, two different approaches were taken. So the first approach was Approximately 900,000 9 lakh doses of the oral cholera vaccine were sent to Mozambique and a large scale vaccination program was organized. So they received this cholera vaccine and people were vaccinated just like these days we are having the corona vaccination. And the number two, number two was another way by which they handled this problem. Medical centers were set up in Mozambique to treat people with cholera. So number one was the vaccination program. And number two was the medical centers where people suffering from cholera were treated. So that's a different story. The person only, they weren't normal people. They weren't healthy people there. They were only the people who were suffering from cholera. So suggest and explain how the two different approaches. So these were the two different approaches to prevent a greater number of cases of cholera from occurring. So you have to talk of them separately. Now this one, first we are talking of the vaccination issue. So vaccines stimulate what? Immunity to cholera. People do not become ill with cholera. Herd immunity. Herd immunity means a large number of people are vaccinated. So then there is no, there are no, no, no people who are going to transfer it from one to the other because there are no sufferers. So that's called herd immunity. Please look that up if you don't know that. Just put it in the Google search and look it up. And this, of course, will reduce the reservoir of pathogens in the population because if out of 100 people, only one is infected, but he is the only one who is going to pass it on. 99 of them are not affected. Not They are so reduces the reservoir of pathogen in the population. Now the treatment, these medical centers which were established, how did they help? They helped by, you know, you, we gave them rehydration therapy so the cure more quickly. They didn't die of it. They didn't die of de re dehydration and they didn't 
so they recovered very quickly and they were back on their feet and uh, back to work this is a decreased risk of spread by contaminated feces so one point here then one point here then more able to produce good hygiene you know they educated the people that this is why you are getting this disease so you need to prevent these things time spent in the medical center acts as a quarantine then decreased proportion of infected people to reduce risk of spread so all these factors were the treatment by the medical centers people when they went in there and got medicine so monitor antibiotic use so you see all these factors resulted in we were given they were given antibiotics and they ensured that the people completed the course of antibiotics then less uh, number of people infected so less spread of the disease then if they spent time and they were sick they were in the medical center so this was acting as a quarantine and they were taught so more able to practice good hygiene they realized how they were spreading it from one person to the other how they were just defecating everywhere or whether there were the flies everywhere how they would prevent flies sitting on their food cover the food wherever it was present so all these factors affected and led led to the number of cases decreasing this completes question 5 and 6 and uh, i hope this is helpful and i hope you can revise the different chapters which are not very clear to you so that whenever you struggle in any question you just go back take out the syllabus go through the syllabus points and then revise it uh, from the book or from any notes that you use and uh, best of luck and all the very best in your november exam